Amazing, amazing work. And um, so my name is Eric Drury. I work in digital identity and digital trust. And in this context, I'm working with the Trust Over IP Foundation. And as Pallavi said, for the last couple of months, we've been working. Uh, part of our contribution is to show the amazing work that Bhutan has been doing and spread the word. Because uh, as you know, in 2024, 2025, there's going to be a lot of work on national digital identity in Europe. And we wanted to make sure that the work that's being done elsewhere is available as a reference and uh, for other countries and, and implementers to learn from. So, um, and, and I made this point. So I, I was in Bhutan in, in October, and I met with the team, and I told them that, that perhaps there was more excitement outside of Bhutan with what, with what was happening, with what they were doing, than inside. And that's one of the things that I wanted to talk about. So we'll just do a, a few questions here. But um, the opposite of perhaps entrepreneurship that Louis was talking about, Louis was talking about, what is the key to innovating on a national governmental scale? Because Bhutan is, is innovate, has innovated in gross national happiness and deciding that 60% of their land will be conserved in per perpetuity. So there's always thinking ahead, forward thinking. So what is, what is the, the key to innovating on national level? Right. Uh, I do think that uh, being led by a, a visionary leader that we have found in His Majesty our King, I think that is uh, you know what really drove it because it came from a, uh, as a personal vision that uh, we need to have a digital trust ecosystem, but that a uh, one that prioritizes. Uh, citizens' right to privacy. I think uh, that vision has been our North Star uh, that has guided us along the way. So uh, that is, uh, of course, one, but uh, not very opposite to what he mentioned. I think uh, the trust that has been placed on individuals, because, of course, we have been provided with the North Star, but to navigate and to create while uh, you know uh, we look at the North Star, I think that has been important. And we have been given that freedom to innovate as we go, to learn and adapt, uh, to constantly iterate on the product, on the platform design, even on the use cases, uh, to think how the use cases can be designed so that it addresses local problems uh, that the society faces, uh, keeping the context in mind. I think uh, these are the things. Uh, and just particularly and specifically about uh, identity itself, uh, Bhutan did have a very integrated ID ID system already in place. So I think that really helped. It helps that we ha are a population of uh, less than a million. So uh, it uh, it worked out in our favors. Okay, so so uh, making the switch from innovation, big thinking, forward thinking, vision, talking pragmatics. So you, what what are the pragmatic decisions that you made in this journey that have have helped you achieve this in, in a pretty short time too. Right. Um, so, um, I mean, uh, around uh, things like cost, I think, uh, you know, we did have a lot of freedom considering it is a government uh, project which is very socially focused. Uh, we did not have uh, we did not have mandates around uh, profits uh, right from the get go. I think that really helped. Uh, but eventually that will be, you know, that, that's where we have to look because the product and the platform has to be sustainable. Uh, so we are looking at various business models, revenue streams, pricing strategies, uh, so, uh, so that um, maybe we can uh, build a pricing model around uh, verification services or maybe consulting services, uh, identify revenue streams for maybe selling technology, um, off-the-shelf technology uh, outside of Bhutan or even to service providers, maybe selling uh, microservices outside. So uh, there are very various uh, models that we are looking at, uh, but we have not reached that mandate yet. We are still a very socially focused uh, project. So the focus has been uh, on uh, other pragmatic uh, things like inclusion, uh, making sure that citizens have what they need, the right infrastructure in place so that they can thrive in an ecosystem like this. So, so cost, yeah, cost is one of the, the driving decisions in terms of, uh, I think uh, initially it was ima imagined to be a traditional PKI-based PKI system for national identity. 
And as a lot of countries are seeing that it just makes more sense to use decentralized technology, not only decentralized principles of identity, but decentralized technologies as well. As well. So that uh, had an impact on cost. Um, and when you talk about inclusion, so we've seen the mountains, we've seen how difficult it is to get to some parts of, of the country. Um, specifically, what are, you, what are you doing again for the inclusion to make sure that these people are also included in, the, that they have a national identity as well? Uh, right, so there are two aspects uh, around that. One is uh, focusing on education and advocacy, but the other one is also creating uh, products that meets these requirements uh, from a technical perspective itself. So uh, I'll touch upon uh, the technology bit first. Uh, like I already mentioned, we are working on custodial wallet, hybrid wallet, so that it can be controlled by someone else. Uh, the guardianship and controllership uh, uh, features of the wallet will allow not just uh, in terms of legal authorization, but at a functional level, it will allow you to appoint uh, a guardian or a controller of your wallet if you are not capable of doing it yourself, particularly if you're a minor or if you are um, a very old person but still need to access services. So these are things we are also looking at uh, at creating a kind of a printed, uh, a very dense format of cryptographic QR code, uh, which uh, that citizens who do not have smartphones or feature phones can take it, carry along with them to service providers, uh, and uh, they can just get that scanned, and all of their digital, all of their credentials can be pulled into the system just through that printed card. This is uh, just being conceptualized, but we do hope that we can take it there. Um, in terms of uh, education and advocacy, uh, what we are doing is uh, there is in Bhutan, we have a, a volunteer organization called the Desung Organization. So uh, we partner with them and uh, the Desops, uh, the volunteers, basically have gone door to door uh, educating citizens and uh, talking about what are the benefits of this, uh, how they can use it, how they can onboard on the platform, what they can do with it. We have rolled it out in three districts, uh, very rugged, Bumthang, Trongsa, and Ha. You, you are very aware of the place, so in these places, but we still have 17 more districts to go. Um, the reason, sorry. Can I ask you, so what is the reception? What is the understanding of a digital identity? Not just digital identity, but self-sovereign identity. Is there... What is, what is that, the reception from the general public like? Right. Uh, this is a very tricky question because, uh, you know, when you communicate with your users, you have to speak their language because uh, in, the rural, uh, in the rural areas, if you are speaking to them about uh, uh, your uh, data security and privacy, they don't care. They don't, uh, they don't know what it means and they couldn't care less. So uh, with them, uh, the messaging strategy has been about convenience, how they can access services without having to travel far distances. And we don't n not necessarily talk about data security and privacy with them. But uh, residents of urban areas, of course, our focus is more on uh, you know, educating and creating awareness uh, around uh, privacy and security. Bhutan also has this very unique context where citizens and residents just trust uh, each other, uh, there is no doubt that somebody is going to steal your data or going to manipulate it in any way or uh, target you with uh, advertisements. So uh, you'll come across them on the on the street the next day. So. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. So they do not have these concerns. Uh, and I, I would say that this is one of the most challenging aspects. It has been one of the most challenging aspects of the project because to communicate uh, the philosophy and the value of SSI, I think that has been the most difficult aspect because it's a very, uh, it's simple, but it's simple only once you have been uh, working with it for maybe two years. But uh, until then, it's not really simple and it's very difficult to you know, translate that message uh, around security and privacy. So we try to uh, uh, create our messaging strategy based on the user and just uh, do user and customer segmentation. Okay. That, uh, you, you talked about the challenges. That was going to be my next question. 
Uh, any, I'm looking at the time, so any other challenges that you, that you would talk about? And then maybe if anybody else has questions uh, from the audience, we could take one or two. But what, what other sort of challenges, or, or, and then we'll finish with learnings, but first, any other major challenges when you're going through this? Uh, right, so one I already spoke about, communication and uh, translating that message, the value proposition, that has been very difficult. But even in terms of technology development, I think uh, it has been a very steep learning curve for us, we didn't, like I mentioned, have a reference, uh, you know, where we can learn from, whose learnings we can incorporate into product development. So it was just uh, uh, trying and failing and then adapting as we went by. Of course, we did have uh, the support of people like you, but I do specifically want to mention Andrew because he was one of our early consul consultants along with uh, Scott Perry and Drummond Reed. And, and, you, and uh, one thing to note, it's a very small team, which I think is a strength. When you're doing a big project like this, small team working fast, quick iterations, um, is, is another lesson to, to probably learn. Right. We, when we started working uh, with the project, I think uh, it was just even among team members, one-on-one -on -one speaking, we always had this conversation that we need to be agile, we need to keep an open mind, and we need to be okay with failing. So when, how would you summarize the, the learnings? If you had to offer lessons or learnings, how would you? Because, one of, again, one of the things that we're trying to do here is to share um, not just for this, uh, for the audience here and, and, and online, but many countries in the global south, uh, emerging markets in Europe are, are starting to go through this journey. So what would you offer them as lessons? Right. Uh, I think this is something I already uh, spoke about earlier and something that Louis spoke about as well. Uh, you should uh, be willing to fail. I, I don't think it's good to wait for a perfect product because uh, that's never going to come because the ecosystem is constantly evolving. The market requirements and needs are constantly evolving. So to uh, get to a point where you think your product is perfect, I, I I think it's going to be a long journey. So I would, uh, my suggestion would be to roll it out and then constantly iterate and be willing to just innovate and adapt as you go. And uh, the second one would definitely be uh, that uh, we should, I think, work as uh, not just uh, as teams within uh, the organization, but as, uh, teams as part of this industry and just share knowledge uh, like we have done, uh, like I mentioned with Andrew, with, uh, they have been, uh, they were our initial consultants. And I think the, uh, the courage to even believe that we can roll out a, a product like this at a national scale was because we got the confidence and the validation from the industry experts that we are in the right direction. So I think exchanging knowledge uh, would be the other advice. Are there any questions? Anybody? I mean, Pallavi will be around all week, but yes, please. Uh, did Bhutan have a history of sort of identity cards before this? Had they got any experience in managing identity centrally? Uh, yes, uh, we do have. So we have a central uh, citizenship ID system. Uh, it is uh, again managed by uh, managed by the Department of Civil Registration and Census for the citizens, and it is this existing data uh, that the government already had, uh, which is the source of truth even for uh, Bhutan NDI as a product. So when you are onboarding on uh, the wallet. Uh, what we do is we insert all of our information that is actually already maintained by DCRC and then we bypass a biometric facial scan which again gets matched to the data uh, with DCRC and then uh, once you uh, establish yourself by authenticating that you are in fact who you claim to be is then uh, is when you get your digital identity and other credentials and based on this foundational id you can access other government and business services and also get other credentials so the truth of source is the foundational id which was already existing which is stored on the device yeah and it's only stored on the device not on any third party cloud servers mm -hmm. Do we have time for any more questions? Hi, Lee Suka from Cinch. Um, you talked about 90,000 plus ad adoptees. At what point of the adoption curve do you think more private sector enterprises will imagine use cases and value that they can derive? Um, 
It is, uh, it is an ecosystem uh, that is uh, constantly building, even from user adoption and uh, businesses. So uh, because the government has been driving, and as, as I mentioned, there is a government push, uh, and the use case designs have been to solve problems around compliance, uh, around <laughs> customer authentication, uh, things that can cost organizations a lot of money if they were to invest in these things. So, uh, but I do think that if we at least reach 50% adoption, then uh, we could see the ecosystem coming together and thriving. Uh, that would be my five. Yeah. Five. Yeah. But part of part of uh, the the roadmap is also to have all private enterprises have digital legal entity identifiers as well. So bringing them into the ecosystem as well, understanding the the, the different constructs. Do it one more. Uh, Alexandra Smider, Vonage. Uh, I have a question. How did you did you challenge with the problem of having data up to date because all the data are stored on the device how to ensure it's still available up to date uh, right uh, so uh, as it is uh, driven by SSI uh, with great uh, power comes great responsibility it will be the citizens are uh, duty to constantly update it uh, but uh, the push also uh, can, we can automate the push from a business partner side. For example, uh, the banks can push uh, automatically every year for updated EKYC, but it will still be the citizens' res responsibility to consent to updating their EKYC. Uh, if they do not, of course, it comes with other problems that maybe their access to portals and services could be halted or suspended until they meet that uh, that updation uh, on a yearly basis. It depends on uh, you know the sector that you're operating in. Okay. Um, just uh, one last question before we move on. Um, we had a question from the online audience from Saeed, and it is: um, Can private companies access the NDI database by paying a fee? Uh, no, absolutely not. <laughs> uh, <coughs> like we uh, we already spoke about decentralized, so except for the authorizing agency the only other uh, the only other place where the data is stored is in your wallet and it is decentralized it is built on edge technology so uh, maybe you as an individual probably can sell your data if you want to but organizations will not be able to do that all right well um, before we uh, say goodbye to you i think michael has a presentation to make. <coughs> uh. <coughs> So um, Bhutan won the MEFI's ID and Data Award at the Mobile World Congress this year, and we want to give her an award. Thank you so much. This is such a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.